really interesting. It actually starts off by saying this is the biggest issue that's facing us, but it's also the biggest issue we keep avoiding. Mm -hmm. And my experience just traveling around and, and talking to people in different contexts and different churches is that uh, many people recognize how important this is, but they also recognize how little we've spoken about it. And I think what I've observed in the last 20 years is as the issue has become more prominent, people have become more reluctant to speak about it because there's, there's so much more at stake and it's become so complex. And so what I want to do in this next... Um, you, you're, I can tell this isn't a Baptist chapel because you haven't got a clock at the back there. So um, I shall keep an eye on the time. Oh, I'll say. Um, what, uh, I want us to do two things, really. I want us to step back but I also want us to step forwards. What I mean by that is I want us to step back to look at the big picture. And the reason for that is that when you start getting into the debates around sexuality, particularly around same-sex relationships, gay marriage, and all those sort of things, what happens is people zoom in microscopically on a few short texts or even one or two words and as they zoom in, they start punching out. <laughs> so we end up, quite a lot of the debates about sexuality, certainly in my context in the Church of England, is we get people sort of like grabbing each other and sort of trying to hit each other and score points around particular words in particular texts. And that, neither of those things are really helpful for productive discussion. Zooming in so closely, microscopically on the detail, number one, and being so combative in our discussion about it. So, what I've found is that actually, if we stand back a bit, we get a bigger picture, a better picture, uh, and also it takes the heat out of it, because um, actually looking at the big picture isn't about contesting microscopic details. It's about saying, what's the vision here? Um, if I can offer an, an analogy, I've got it in a later slide, but it's not worth, not worth going to that. So uh, it's a little bit like if you, um, I've been to Honolulu once, <laughs> uh, and I only went there for an hour. Uh, we, um, when, when Maggie and I first got married, she had a sabbatical time in the, in the old days when people did have sabbaticals. And uh, we, um, so we did a sort of round the world tour. And we, so we flew, we went to see some friends in Canada, we flew then to New Zealand. If you fly from Canada to New Zealand, you usually have to stop off at Honolulu because it's a jolly long way. Um, but what's really interesting about Hawaii and the Hawaiian archipelago is that if you look at it from a plane, all you see is little individual isolated islands in the big blue of the Pacific. And if you didn't know anything about geology, you'd think these were just kind of like little disconnected things. And that's very often how we treat the text about sexuality. Uh, and we pick on individual texts and we'll wrestle about that. Oh, Matthew 19... You know, in the resurrection, they'll be like the angels, neither marrying or giving marriage. What does Jesus mean by that? Um, oh, we just pick out these individual texts. Actually, if you go under the sea, what you find is that the, uh, these islands are just little things poking above the surface of an a underwater terrain. And the question is, what does that terrain look like? So interesting, I found myself um, in a discussion, a debate in a different denomination a couple of years ago where we were doing the little punching up about the individual text. And I just stopped, and I, rather than disengaging with that, I just said to the person I was talking to, I said, you know the person who wrote Leviticus 18 and 20? What do you think that person believed about sexuality? Why are they, why are they saying these particular things? And he said, well, it's interesting, I've never thought about that. <laughs> so, and we haven't, most of us haven't. So what I want to do is to stand back and I want to look at what the whole of Scripture says about sexuality in half an hour. <laughs> but I want to do that by offering you eight theses. Theses, plural of thesis. Eight affirmations about what the big picture of Scripture says about sexuality. So it would be useful if I can have the first slide up. Because if I haven't got the slides, I don't know what I'm going to say. Oh, it's here. Oh, fine. It's not fine. I was looking up there. Okay, so, eight affirmations. Number one, sex is a good gift from God. Sex is a good gift from God. If you don't think that's shocking and surprising, then you need to read a little bit of church history, and you just need to step out the door and just 
dip your head into social media and our, our culture and our world. Because I think there are two really big forces in the world which say, tell us, sex is a bad thing. Now, looking at the inside of the church, actually, if you just want to turn to uh, Revelation 7 verse 1, there's a really interesting clue that shows how we've struggled with this idea that sex is a good thing. Uh, Excellent. So, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says this. Now, for the matters about which you wrote, which we don't know because we haven't got the letter from the Corinthians to Paul, which is a real pain, actually. Oh, there we go. It is good for a man not to marry. Or actually, what he says is, it's, it, it, that's a euphemism, it's good for a man not to have sex. Actually, what Paul says is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's just a euphemism for sexual intercourse. Now, what's, what's really interesting is this version, which I just purloined from Gareth, doesn't have that in quotation marks. It simply says, it is good for a man not to have sex. And that's what the church has mostly read that verse to say. Basically, sex is a bad thing, it's an inconvenience, it's a bit dangerous, it's misleading, it's certainly, you don't want your young people to do it, so just stay away, don't do it. Okay, there's a summary sex talk of almost all churches and teenagers, don't do it, all right? That's it. Am I right? (laughs) Um, So I'm looking to Rachel as a youth worker, not as a, no, sorry. That could have been misunderstood. Okay, so... uh, (laughs) But what's really interesting is that this, in a footnote, and most contemporary translations elevate the footnote to the main text, is they say, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But it's in inverted commas. Do you see the difference? The first way, the way that the church has often read this is Paul is telling the Corinthians, sex is a bad idea, stay away. If you have to, fine. But mostly, best to be like me. Leave it alone, right? If it's in inverted commas, it's the opposite. It's the Corinthians who are saying to Paul, sex is a bad thing. And Paul's saying, hmm, actually not. Do you know what? It's God who made male and female. And God who gave male and female bits to do things with. Do you know, when God made Adam and God made Eve, and then they discovered they were different, and then they made use of it, God didn't go, oh my goodness, what are they doing? I didn't imagine that. God was not surprised. God actually intended, that's what the creation narrative says, God intended men and women to have sex and to enjoy it. Adam knew Eve and she conceived, it says in Genesis 4 verse 1, which just goes to show that familiarity breeds. Come on, give me, go on. (laughs) Now, the, re- the reason this is interesting is that I, I um, uh, a couple of years ago, our youngest daughter was going on her gap year, and um, she, was, she had six weeks in Costa Rica. Whoa. Uh, actually, she's supposed to be teaching language to kids and stuff, but she didn't. Anyway, but I, I had to take her to the airport, down to uh, Gatwick Airport. We had a two-hour two car drive, and then we had a dinner overnight because her flight was early the next morning, and then we were, I was going to go back. So she said, hey, we've got five hours, six hours of father-daughter time. What should we do? And I said, well, what do you want to talk about? She said, let's do the sex talk thing. And I said, oh, okay. She said, uh, I said, um, do you think we haven't talked to you enough about uh, sex and relationships? She said, dad, no Christian parents ever talk to their kids enough about it. And so I said, well, I've got this talk. Should we go through it? So I said, right, number one, sex is a good gift from God. She just looked at me like we're driving down the M1. She no, I was there, she was there. She looked at me and goes, Dad, in all the things I've done, in all the talks you sent me to at New Wine or whatever this is, no one has ever said that to me. And I think we need to say to our young people, sex is not an accident. Sex is a good gift from God. But the reason why we need to say it to the church, we need to say it to the world as well, because I think our culture says sex is a bad thing. It says it in two ways. Feminism says sex difference is a bad thing because all it ever does is, is, is um, disadvantage women. Therefore, we want to eliminate sex difference. And it says, after all, sex does so much damage. Look at all those men who rape women. By and large, our culture says sex is bad. And I think that's why young people are actually having less sex. It's complicated. It's messy. 
uh, it leads to all sorts of nasty things and it's basically damaging. So we've got some, something to, some work to do. Okay, that's affirmation number one. I can't spend them in as much time on the rest. Second affirmation, we are bodily. To be human is to be bodily. Now, I don't use the word embodied because that sounds as though our real selves are these ethereal spirits and we have been poured into bodies. That is not what Scripture says. Scripture says that if I can, we are body-soul unities. Now, the technical term for that is psychosomatic. We are psychosomatic unities. If you just want to be a theologian, take something simple and put it into Greek, and it sounds really fancy and complicated. Psychos is a, means soul or life or in the, the interior person, and soma means body, psychosomatic unity. We are body-soul unities. Uh, and that's why when the incarnation happened, when, when, when God became human, it, it involved become, taking a bodily form. It also means that our eternal destiny in Christian theology is bodily. Our personal destiny is not for our spirits to be liberated from our bodies to be in a disembodied state with God in heaven. That is Platonism. The Christian hope is when we die, we sleep in death, and we wait with expectation, bodily resurrection. That's why I bore my wife for this, because every time it comes up, I always remind people, and she's sitting there, and she goes, oh, yeah. that when I die, because I'm almost certain to predecease her, because men have lower life expectancy than women, uh, I said, do not cremate me. I forbid it. She knows. So I am to be buried. The reason is not because it makes a practical difference, because my body will rot. I know that but because it symbolizes, it's, it's part of a symbolic world where we, if our destiny is bodily, that's why Christians distinctively buried, Jews buried their dead and Christians buried their dead as, in, in that Jewish tradition. Well, sorry, all the first Christians were Jews. So um, that's it's a distinctly distinctive about our eternal destiny. Our corporate destiny is not to be floating around together and catching up with all our mates. Our corporate destiny is bodily resurrection, and we will reign with him on earth forever. In Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem comes down. Heaven comes down to earth. Now, this does raise a question about what Jesus means in Matthew 22 when he says in the resurrection they'll be like the angels, but we'll come back to that. It doesn't mean they'll be disembodied. When angels visit people, they come in a bodily form. So that's affirmation number two. Affirmation number three. Now, I've put the heading there. We are gendered. That's wrong. We're not. It's the wrong word. And we can get in the Q&A into a discussion about the relationship between the word gender and the word sex. But I only put that up because putting the right word up sounds odd. What we are is we are sexed. Before 1960, everyone knew what it meant to be sexed. Uh, Pride and Prejudice. Um, where um, Darcy is talking about what constitutes a, um, uh, a talented a talented woman. Is that the right word he, word he uses? And a, that's right. Anyway. Bright eyes, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. But anyway, he says that, you know, uh, to, for a woman to be um, truly outstanding, she must be competent in the arts, widely read, speak several languages. And, 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 uh, and, 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 and Elizabeth says, well, you're so, I wonder, you know any talented women? He says, are you so hard on your own sex? Which sounds really odd to us, but because until 1960, we used the word sex to describe what it means to be male and female. And the consistent testimony of scripture is that we are sexed. To be human is to be bodily, but to be bodily is to be sexed. There is no generic body. So when Jesus assumed bodily form, by the way, only God can do that. None of us can ever do incarnational ministry. Uh, it's one of my little hobby horses of mine. The other is use of the word church. You don't never use the word church in an essay either, okay? Never say incarnational and never use the word church. Inca incarnational, as from Latin, carne meaning, as in chili con carne, um, means enfleshed, but you can only be enfleshed if you weren't. Only God can be incarnate. We can't be incarnate because we have no choice. We are body, soul, unities. It's what it is to be human. Now, this is actually, and I think this is why... Um, a, a friend of mine tweeted this morning, uh, how can you read the creeds and the fathers and patristic debates and, and doctrine 
and think that sexual ethics is a primary doctrinal issue. To which my response is, how can you read the creeds, the fathers, and the doctrinal disputes, and not think this is fundamental? Um, and the reason is that here's the central mystery of what it means to be sexed, bodily, and human. That is, an immaterial God expressed God's intention through the creation of a material world, which is actually pretty stunning in the first place. Here's the second thing. A non-sexed God uh, created humanity in God's image sex. The greatest mystery, well, almost, yeah, yeah, there were. The greatest mystery and the weirdest text in the whole of the Bible is Genesis 1.27. Immaterial, unsexed God made humanity in his image, male and female. The writer of Genesis is putting those things right next to each other. And if you don't think that's shocking, we've missed a trick. It's absolutely four square at the center. What it, I believe in God Almighty, the creator, the creator, the creator, unsexed God who made humanity sexed. It's, it's, it's extraordinary and it's bizarre. Um... Now, I want to kind of say that Genesis, or the biblical narrative, doesn't assert sexed humanity. It simply assumes sexed humanity. That's not quite true, because other ancient Near East cultures had a range of views about sexedness. And the, I think the biblical narrative does actually take this, this sex dimorphism as actually a central part of what it means to be human created in the image of God. Now, the, the, the text is, the, the whole description of that sex creation is uh, counter-cultural in all sorts of ways. Uh, so, but most, most obviously that, in other ancient Near East texts, other people were made in the image of the God, but it was usually either men or it was um, kings. And, and Genesis is radically countercultural in asserting that all humanity, both sexes, are made in the image of God. And the language of suitable helper we find in the second creation account, Genesis 2, it's a quite an unusual phrase, but essentially it means equal and opposite. A friend of mine who's an Old Testament scholar said this, that language is the kind of language you'd use about two banks of a river. If you have a, if you have a river flowing between two banks... What level do those banks have to be at? I know this because I just dug a pond on Friday. We had to make the edges of the pond the same height. Otherwise, what's going to happen? The water's going to flow out. You can't have a pond or a river with, with one bank higher or lower than the other. That's the image. That's the image we've got in creation of, of humanity, male and female. Differentiate. You can't have one bank of a river and the river going, it just, it, that's a floodplain. You've got to have two, but they've got to be equal. That's the fundamental vision of humanity in creation. And sex, differ sex differentiation, not gender, sex differentiation is the foundation of sexual union. Now, in the marriage service in the Church of England, we say, what God has um, joined, let no one put asunder. Actually, the creation account kind of says it all around. It says, what God has put asunder, that's what we join. The reason why there's union in sex and sexual relationships is because the creation account says this one humanity was differentiated by God into male and female. And that the fact that God in creation did the differentiation is the foundation of union. So it's what God has divided finds uh, uh, union in sex and sexual relationships. Okay, number three. Number four. Our, our sex identity is not something that stands alone or stands out there or is exceptional. It's part of an integrated humanity. So all the way through scripture, even though in some places, particularly in the Song of Songs, you get an elevated focus on sexual pleasure. And I have to say, when I came to face as a teenage boy going to an all-boys school, when I discovered the Song of Songs, that was a bit of a revelation. Never mind the book of Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of did the thing that it sounds very childish, isn't it? But this is what teenage boys do. And you go when you discover this thing called the Bible, you go through and you find all sorts of all the interesting things, like in Proverbs where it says that um, uh, living with a nagging wife is worse than a tap that goes drip, 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 or better to live on the corner of a roof of a house than with a nagging wife. And I must admit, I've never made use of those verses in my last 27 years of marriage. But or a fool who does the same thing twice is like a dog that goes back to his vomit. 
and you all go, Ew. actually as a dog owner, I found that's true and it's very useful because it means that you don't have to clear the mess up. So anyway, <laughs> but in, in the Song of Songs, uh, there is pleasure. Again, it's, this is, <laughs> God didn't, when, when whoever wrote the Song of Songs wrote the Song of Songs, God didn't go, what? You're going to put that in my Bible? Get out of it. And everyone says, oh, it's about Jesus and the church. But, do you know, when I read this verse, it says, uh, your breasts are like clusters of grapes. I'm going to climb the vine and enjoy the fruit. Do you know, I have to say, that sure sounds like sex to me, you know? I don't know what the spiritual reading of that is. I think I know a little bit about the real reading, not least because I'm married on the one hand, and I've got a grapevine in my greenhouse as well. So, um, uh, But it's not something isolated and separated it's actually designed to be integrated and I want to blow a trumpet here for the Church of England because I'm we're next week we're heading off to France in order for us to do a wedding blessing ceremony which has been postponed two years because of Covid and it's just really good to go through again what the what the Anglican liturgy says I don't know if there are any Anglicans here at all no okay yes way whoa Ray, preach it right yes and here so just go back and look at the preface in the marriage service and what it says. It says that, may the union of your bodies strengthen the union of your hearts and minds. You know, the, the wedding marriage service actually is upfront about sex. The, 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 the Church of England expects people when they get married to have sex and to enjoy it. But for it to be one part of this, we have this symbolic union, union of hearts, of minds, of wallets, of housing, of parenting, of functioning together in the community. Uh, the, one of the vows says, all that I have, I share with you. All that I am, I give to you. There's a mutual self-giving of, of the self. And sex is a part of that. Sex expresses it and sex strengthens it. Isn't that interesting? The Church of England believes if you have more sex, then you're actually going to do the washing up for each other more or, or, or clean out the shower when you've made a mess or, in my case, you know, tidy up the sink when I've shaved my beard and left bits of hair that it tries to make you mad. But actually, these things are related to one another because in, in the sex act, you symbolise that mutual, literally interpenetrating self-giving of one another. And that's, that the idea is that spills over into all the other aspects of your life. Affirmation number five. Sex has power. Sex is powerful. Do I need to say any more about that? Gets your heart rate going... Uh, I mean, it, it, I've, I've got a theory that almost every, every single socio-political conflict in the world basically is rooted in sex. <laughs> the reason I say that is because it's sex and, the, and, the, and what sex leads to. Yasser Arafat in the Arab-Israeli conflict in, in the Middle East said once, the wombs of Palestinian women are the greatest weapon in our struggle. I mean, I think... That would probably be seen as pretty sexist now. But what do you... What, okay, so here's the thing. In 1947-48 war, 750,000 Palestinian Arabs were displaced and went to different countries. Some went north, Lebanon, some went uh, to Jordan, some went to Egypt, uh, some went to other parts of the Arab world. Some went to Gaza. Some of those 750,000 people went to Gaza. Do you know how many people live in Gaza today? 1.4 million. So the question is, sorry, where did they come from? <laughs> the answer is, they had sex. And they had lots of babies. And this is a way in which, this is what Putin is doing with, uh, in the Don in um, um, uh, um, Ukraine and everything. So there's a whole thing about, if, you're, if, if your ethnic group grows more than the other ethnic group, you end up dominating it. That's why the, the situation with Israel-Palestine is intractable now, because when there are only like 200,000 people in Gaza, you could deal with that. There's 1.4 million people. It's the most densely populated place on earth. How on earth are you going to resolve that? It's impossible. Sex has power. Sex has personal power over us. I don't want to get too personal here and disclose too much. I don't know if this is going to be made public, but okay, let me just put it in the third person. When young people have sexual experiences, they will remember those for the rest of their lives. There's, no, there's just no way, there's no doubt about that. 
whether they're good experiences or bad experiences. And interestingly, Scripture agrees. Um, when, he, when God creates humanity, he gives them power. He says, I'm delegating you my power and authority to rule over the earth. And Adam and Eve go, well, how are we going to do that? And God says, be fruitful and multiply. And they look at each other and go, okay, this is number one task in subduing the earth. And it's really interesting that whenever sex and sexual ethics and sexual immorality are mentioned in the New Testament, they're always connected with eternal destiny. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, the most shocking thing that Paul says is uh, that um, those who do this, 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 and this, and this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified. So there's something really serious and really powerful going on here. And again, it's really interesting when Jesus talks about the things that defile a person, he mentions sexual immorality at the top of the list. He uses three different terms for it. The idea that Jesus never talked about sex is only interested in economic justice. It's just nonsense. I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what gospels people are reading. The, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, he gives like half a chapter to sexual morality right up front. Blessed are you and people personally run away. Right, let's talk about sex. Okay, so it's powerful stuff. And thesis number six, I hope this isn't too controversial, we are fallen. We, the, the, the scripture uses a, a range of vocabulary here. The language of the fall has been used to describe the, what happened in Genesis 3 as a sort of archetypal narrative of human uh, reality and rebellion against God. The reason we use the word the fall is because of Paul's language in Romans 3, 23, which says, all have, fallen sh all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. But we are fallen. And it's really interesting that when you read the shape of that narrative, the prominence given to sex and marital relationships. So when uh, Adam and Eve make the wrong decision, and however you, however you interpret that, I don't want to get into the, the, debate, the theological debates there, and end up going their own path rather than the, the way that God wanted. What's one of the first impacts of that? And that is a distortion of both the power dynamic between the man and the woman. Uh, you will re rule over her in an oppressive way, she, but she will still desire you despite. So she will love you even if you abuse her. That's a bit of a contemporary text, isn't it? Um, uh, and she will have pain in childbirth. So this whole, the whole dynamic at the center of their relationship has been spoiled. And that's why, generally speaking, uh, desire in the New Testament, I think, is given a pretty negative thing. It's spin because, it's, because we have fallen. Now, what do you do with something that's really powerful, but something's gone wrong, and now it's really dangerous? Because of its power, Okay, so cars are a good thing. I got in my car and I drove over here and I, I was told to divert over the top because of this lorry or whatever. But I'm driving a 3.5 litre Freelander. I'll just eat up those hills with no trouble at all and come down this windy track. Not a problem until I meet another Freelander coming the other way. But, do you know, it's, it's a powerful car and that is good. Except if I look at my phone, I fall asleep at the wheel and then this is going to do a massive amount of damage. So what happens is somebody had the idea of restricting where my car can go by putting boundaries around it. I'm only to drive on these roads here, not over on the pavement, not across on the other side of the road, there's a white line there. These are serious restrictions because though power can be used for good, when things have gone wrong and it goes out of control, you're in real trouble. And the more powerful something is, the stronger those boundaries have to be to contain it and to channel that power towards the good and away from wrecking and damaging other people's lives. Um, when I was at uh, school, um, I, I did chemistry A-level. I quite liked it. Um, but in those days, we didn't have health and safety. <laughs> so we sat in benches in the chemistry lesson. And in front of me, I can remember seeing three glass jars. And one of them said concentrated hydrochloric acid, concentrated nitric acid, and concentrated sulfuric acid. And I thought, hmm, I bet those could do stuff. And we knew they could, because when the teacher got the ammonia bottle out, 
The lids of these bottles fumed with power and potency. They were just waiting to get out of the bottles and interact with the ammonia, because they were opposite, you see, and they interact and do all sorts of powerful things. Our teacher also taught us how to make detonator, which is a mistake, because when we went out of the room, we made it. And we put it on the radiator. It's a detonator which is stable when the radiator is cold, but then when it dries out and it gets hot, it goes off. So after 20 minutes after we came back in, the detonator went off. Anyway, that's just an example of why, why boundaries really matter. And boundaries matter when something is powerful. And if sex really is as powerful as we think it is, then those boundaries really matter. That's why, overall, Scripture is a little bit Puritan. The Old Testament texts are much more puritanical, they're much more bounded on sex relations than any other ancient Near East culture. The prohibition on, the absolute prohibition on same-sex sexual relationships in, in, in the Old Testament is unique. There's a program on TV about the ancient Egyptians and sexuality, and the presenter was saying, oh, these Egyptians, they weren't hung up about sex like, you know, we are in the West. They, you know, basically, they had sex with anything. Sex with animals, sex with... A, Brothers and sisters, you know, whew, yeah, and the net result was they all died. They all died really early. Um, if you look at the, um, you can see online now, the x-ray of Tutankhamun. And it's really clear that he had congenital malformation. He couldn't walk. And the reason is, his parents were brother and sister. He was the product of an incestuous relationship, which is prohibited in the Old Testament, and it's still prohibited today. The, the list of restrictions on who you may marry in Britain is still based on Leviticus. Did you know that? It's in the Book of Common Prayer. Good old Church of England again there. Um, and yeah, no, no, other cultures were very free and easy about sex, and they all had lots and lots of diseases, and they all died young, and they all had lots and lots of malformations. And it's because something that's powerful needs to be bounded. And the thing is, we, this is where we get into a mistake, an error. We think that when Scripture puts boundaries around sex, it's because scripture thinks sex is a bad thing, but it's not. Scripture says sex is a good thing, but it's a powerful thing, and God's given it with a certain intention. And when it goes wrong, when it spins out of control, and my freelander going off the road when it shouldn't do, it's going to wreck the world. And that's why God gives us those boundaries. Okay, last thesis, last affirmation, number eight. Sex is good. Sex is a gift from God. Uh, sex is important because we are bodily and because we're made male and female. But because we're fallen, oh, I mean, it's powerful, and because we're fallen, it's therefore bounded. But in the end, it's not the most important thing. It's a bit easier. I'm going to be 60 this year, and I know that it's a lot easier when you're 60 uh, to say sex doesn't matter that much. <laughs> than when somebody said that to me when I was a 16-year-old teenager. Somebody once said, no, I said it actually, sex is, sex is a bit like money, in that it doesn't matter very much as long as you've got some. It's when you don't have it, it suddenly seems to assume this, ma this much greater importance. But scripture says sex is of only penultimate importance. It is interesting the way that the church has exalted sex, marriage, and having children to almost be the big thing. A friend of mine who's single, she said, I get really, really fed up when you read these testimonies of people who had dramatic conversion experiences. You know, his story, yeah. uh, I was a drug addict, I was a criminal, blah, blah, blah. I had this amazing encounter with God. I came to find Jesus, I came to peace, I, I threw off my drug habit, and now I'm married and I've got three kids. And she, she says, hang on a second. Since when did getting married and having three kids become the result of being saved? Yeah. As, the, as the, 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 you know, pinnacle of proving that God is really good. <laughs> Actually, isn't Jesus enough? And it is really interesting that, again, you look at many of our churches and the assumption is, again, of the sort of, you know, two point whatever kids, married and two point kids, and not problems, no, 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 you know, in the end, if you are, Married and not divorced and haven't got into trouble in that area and whatever. It's a lot easier to be in, a, be in our churches today. And yet, we worship a single saviour. 
This is contested in scholarship, but only because of an ideological agenda. Here's the thing. Okay, let me just say this to you straight. Jesus never had sex. So how come that isn't our model? Well, the answer is it was, it was. Do you know the first ever, in the early church, the first ever theological treatise? Well, if you were going to write... Okay, so here's the, here's the growing new Christian movement. And somebody wants to write a theological thesis. What would you, what would you write it on? Um, incarnation. Uh, atonement. Hmm. Eschatology. Uh, doctrine of God. No, that's too difficult. We'll leave that to the fourth century. Uh, what was the first theological thesis in the church? Answer, it was on virginity. On, it was on, on virgin. virginity. is a big theological thing because Jesus was single and because Paul was single as well. It's not impossible for a rabbi to have been single like Paul, but it was unusual. So here's the thing. Scripture does not see sexuality as defining human identity. That's why in the debate about same-sex issues, people say, oh, the Bible doesn't even mention homosexuality. No, it doesn't, quite rightly too. All it mentions is sex between people of the same sex, sexual action, men having sex with men. That's the best way to translate 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. Scripture in the area of sex is, is, is focused on our actions, not our orientation. The whole idea that we're defined by our interior orientation is a conceit of the modern world. Scripture sees humanity bodily, male and female. That's all that matters. A friend of mine who's gay, who did end up getting married and having three kids, but um, he said for, he, was, he, was, he went to Oxford uh, as an undergraduate. He was... Uh, he, he'd come out of it when he was 14, which is quite unusual in the 1980s, so he's, he was obviously sort of confident in that. When he was an undergraduate, he was a founder member of the, uh, what was it called then, the Christian gay and lesbian thing, whatever, active campaigner. He was sitting in, a, in an, an ethics lecture in the university, and the professor said, God did not make four sexes, Male straight, male gay, female straight, female gay. God made two sexes, male and female. And a light went on for my friend, and he said, I, I realized I've been living my life out as a gay person. Actually, what God was calling me to do is to live my life out as a male human being. This was who I was. This was the ground of my identity, a man in Christ. And he said, that suddenly made all the difference. Orientation is not a fundamental constituent of human beings. Now, just coming back to this phrase, um, like the angels. When Jesus says they will be like the angels, neither marrying nor giving in marriage, he's not denying that we will be male and female, sex differentiated in the new creation. Um, in the subject, I sometimes say to people, do you know, when Jesus was raised from the dead, when he came out of the tomb, did he still have a willy? I find people haven't thought about that very much. <laughs> But actually, it's quite an important question. Have you ever thought about that? Gareth, have you? That's a, that would be, you have? Okay, okay. I just say, Gareth, you're a bit weird. But okay. Just now. Ah, okay, thank you. Look, when Jesus met his disciples, he had the wounds on his hand, probably on his wrist, actually, and a wound on his side. And he invited Thomas to put his finger in, although Thomas never did. So if they said, hey, Jesus, do you still have a willy? He'd go, da-da. He still had. Of course, because although his resurrection body was transformed and discontinuous, it also had continuity. So yes, we will be male and female. I've got a blog article on this if you're interested. We will be male and female in a new resurrection, but it won't matter that much. And it won't matter because being male and female, being sex differentiated, points to a bigger reality. And the bigger reality is that the union between things that are equal but different is a signpost to the ultimate union between the things that are ultimately different, which is God and humanity. That's why in Revelation 19, Revelation 21, it talks about the reunion of heaven with earth, the uniting together of that which was divided by sin and Jesus' death has redeemed and made, given us that union. That union is the thing that sex difference was always pointing to. And when you've got the reality, you no longer need the sign. We won't need to have sex in heaven 
because we'll have ultimate intimate unity with God. When you look at the New Jerusalem, it's a cube. So in this cube, 12,000 stadia each direction, in this cube, why is it a cube? Because the cube symbolizes it's the Holy of Holies in the temple. So in this cube, which space is occupied by God? Answer, all of it. It's the Holy of Holies. In this cube, what space is occupied by the saints, you and I? Answer, all of it. The goal is that we have that intimate unit, so close that God can wipe every tear from our eye, even closer than that, closer than any human being. And that's what sex is pointing to. C.S. Lewis, Lewis has a little story about a boy where parents are trying to explain about sex. And, and uh, they said, um, well, what's the, what's the most pleasurable thing you can do? He said, eating chocolate. And they said, well, kind of, you know, sex between a mother and a father is kind of like that. It's the most pleasurable thing you can do. And the little boy said, so when you're having sex, do you eat chocolate? <laughs> and they couldn't explain why you wouldn't eat. Actually, I think it's quite a good idea. I really like chocolate. But they, they couldn't explain why when you're having sex, you wouldn't also want to eat chocolate. Because the boy says, as far, all, he can, all he can say is that the greatest pleasure is chocolate. But you see, when you've got the greater thing, you don't need that other pleasure. And that's why sex is of penultimate importance.